All right, understanding your religion, seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. This is lesson number 20. Uh, we're studying the sub-doctrine of salvation. This is part one of that study and the title of this particular lesson, The Role of Baptism, The Role of Baptism. So uh, you know, we've gotten way too much material now for me to go back to the very beginning and review everything before we start because we'd, we'd be only doing review. So let's just pick it up from, you know, I'll give you the big, uh, uh, the big uh, picture here. Um, we're studying the, the 10 sub-doctrines that explain God's plan to reconcile sinful man back to himself in an acceptable or a righteous state, right? So we had the first five major doctrine, inspiration, deity of Christ, original goodness, fall of man, reconciliation. When we hit that fifth major doctrine, we said there are 10 sub-doctrines that explain that fifth reconciliation doctrine, okay? Then I said the very first five sub-doctrines, election, predestination, atonement, redemption, and regeneration, those first five sub-doctrines, that's the plan of salvation, that's God's plan. And those five sub-doctrines explain the plan of salvation. Okay? They explain how God did that reconciling of man to himself. All right? Then we said the last five, adoption, justification, perfection, sanctification, and salvation, these last five explain the plan of salvation from five different perspectives. So adoption explains the plan of salvation from a human perspective. Justification explains it from a legal perspective. Perfection from a heavenly perspective. Sanctification from an inward perspective. And the final one that we're going to start studying today, the sub-doctrine of salvation explains it from an eschatological perspective, meaning it studies it from a completion perspective. Okay? Now, so the word salvation uh, comes uh, from a, a Greek word, soteria, which means uh, deliverance, to rescue or to set free. Uh, and so the doctrine of salvation describes the distinction now made between ourselves and others because of God's plan. That's what the sub-doctrine of salvation does. It explains who we are in relationship to other people. For example, if you read Mark 16, 16, which is a, a passage that we very often use when we're you know, uh, uh, studying with someone, it says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. It's almost like a parable, isn't it? Remember we, we learned the parables, parallelism, you know? Uh, uh, so, some, some passages uh, where the writer states an idea and then repeats the same idea in the second stanza, or in the second verse. Well here, states an idea and gives the opposite. So those who are saved, who are they? Well, those who believe and are baptized. And who are those who are not saved? Well, those who disbelieve and obviously would not be baptized. So uh, this passage here is explaining salvation. Who are the saved? Well, they're the ones who obey. They're the ones that respond uh, to the gospel. We are the rescued. We are those who are set free. So um, uh, in the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine explains quite clearly that there are some who are lost and some who are saved. Salvation, soteria, rescue. Okay? Uh, I put up the little picture of the Titanic. You know, when the Titanic sank, it was very obvious there were only two kinds, right? There were only two kinds of people uh, who were passengers on the Titanic. Some were saved, few, but they were saved, they made it, and some were lost. There was no other option. There were no others, well, and some began to live on the sea. No, uh, you know, most went down with the ship, a few were saved. Well, when you're talking about the doctrine of salvation, the Bible explains some are saved, and it gives all the explanation of how and when and who and so on and so forth, and some are lost, all right? So the last sub-doctrine is the briefest to explain in our series because it's the summary of all the doctrines that we've studied so far. So salvation is the doctrine 
that embodies the entire process whereby through God's plan we become holy and innocent and perfect and sons and daughters of God and, and avoid the terrible consequences of sin uh, in one word. So salvation, when you say salvation, this is shorthand for all that we have studied in the series. Let me give you another example of that, not in the Bible, but in everyday usage. You know, sometimes we talk about the presidency, Mr. Obama's presidency. When we use the word president, not president, you're, you're referring to the person, the man or woman who's president, but when you're talking about the presidency, right, what are you talking about? You're talking about the whole thing, right? The, the laws that he passed, the, 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 the situations, the, the relationship he had with Congress and, 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 and the success that he's had and so on and so forth, that's the presidency. You know, when you say what kind of presidency did uh, Abraham Lincoln have or, or Jimmy Carter have, you're talking about the sum total of what happened during that person's you know, office, right? Well, the word salvation is the same thing. When you're talking about salvation, you're talking about all the stuff that we have been breaking down into small detail. All the, doc, all the major doctrines up until reconciliation and all the sub-doctrines, they're compressed all into one single word and that's the word salvation. So when we say we are saved or when we talk about salvation, we're saying in one single word everything I've talked about in the last 19 classes, okay? So salvation is the final result of God's plan, looking at it from the end. Remember I said the, the, five, the last five sub-doctrines, they look at the plan of salvation from the heavenly side, from the inward side, from the, from the legal side. Well, the sub-doctrine of salvation looks at it from the end. When all is said and done, what happens? Boom. Salvation explains what happens. We are rescued. We have all of these things, okay? So an important teaching that stems from this study is how the actions of baptism and communion fit into the overall teachings of these major doctrines. I've taught this class before and one of the things that kind of you know, people say is that, boy, you, you've talked 20 weeks about you know, salvation, great Christian doctrines, and so on and so forth, but you've never talked about baptism. And we talk about baptism like first. And I say, well, because baptism all by itself is not a major Christian doctrine. It fits in to the major Christian doctrine, but by itself, it isn't one of the major Christian doctrines, yet we've made it one of the major Christian doctrines. So at this point, when I'm talking about salvation, okay, now, now is the time to talk about where does, where does the action of baptism, you know, immersion in water, where does that fit in into all of this? And we're going to discuss that in this class. So a lot of times we teach about baptism and we, fit, we focus mainly on how to do it properly and that it should be performed you know, as soon as possible when one acknowledges belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that's true. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, you know, how it's performed. The word baptizo in the Greek means to immerse. That means baptism is by immersion. John the Baptist, you know, what it, John the Immerser. Exactly how did John the Immerser baptize people? Well, he immersed them in water. So you know, that, that's beyond argument now. We, we know that. Okay? There are other Greek words for pouring water. There are other Greek words for sprinkling. The Bible doesn't use those words. It uses the Greek word for immersion. So if someone says, how do you baptize someone? Well, you bury them in the water. You immerse them in the water. That is the biblical way of baptism. So um, <clears throat> after our study of major doctrine, uh, I think we're in better shape to see where baptism fits into the overall picture and context of Christian teaching. And after our study in doctrine, we should be better able to understand the what of baptism. What is it? And the why of it, okay? We know how, as I said. We, we know how to baptize somebody. We immerse them in the water, but why? And where does it fit into all these major doctrines? So, let's put it this way. 
In essence, baptism is the historical moment when we receive the benefits derived from God's plan. You know, the last 20 weeks I've been talking about God's plan. Okay? And talking about it in terms of major Christian doctrine, sub-doctrine, so on and so forth. So baptism is the historical moment when we receive the benefits derived from God's plan. So um, Jesus' historical expression of love happened at the cross. You know, did Jesus love His disciples? Yes. And did He love the people who were sick? Yes. But what is the defining moment when His expression of love, when His greatest expression of love was, was demonstrated historically? Well, at the cross, right? John 3, 16, God so loved His Son, uh, God so loved the world, what did He do? He gave his, where did He gave His Son? On the cross, so that none would perish, but all have eternal life. All right, um, so we can pinpoint historically Jesus' greatest expression of love. We can pinpoint it to the day, to the hour, the cross. Well, in the same way, our historical expression of faith is at the moment of baptism. Uh, did we start believing before baptism? Well, sure. Somebody had to teach us stuff. We, you know, maybe we were a VBS, maybe we had a Bible study, maybe we started asking questions. You know? And slowly but surely, you know, our faith, our belief began to take shape and so on and so forth. Yes, yes, true. It may have taken a couple of years. Some people think that you know, uh, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, like all of that should take place in an hour but the believing part could take years, and the repenting part could take years till the repentance really you know, bears fruit. But there's a historical moment when all of that comes together, and for us, the historical moment where we express our faith according to God's will takes place in baptism. Yeah, Mark 16, 16, I just read it. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. How do we know that's the historical moment? Because the Bible tells us. Someone will say, well, I, I was believing before I was baptized, good for you. That's great. That faith that you had there ultimately led you to make the expression of faith required by God. And what expression is that? <laughs> Baptism. Now we may have, because of our belief, we may have started coming to church. Because of our belief, we may have stopped uh, you know, doing something, I don't know, cursing or swearing, you know, saying to ourselves, you know, I not to do that, you know, now that I've seen in the Bible, you know, let your speech be holy, be holy, for I am holy, you know, you know, yeah, good, 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 good. But the historical expression of faith required by God is not the day you started going to church or the day you started you know, you know, behaving in a better way. So it's the day that you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and based on that understanding, you were baptized in His name. Okay. So baptism is the expression of faith that we make in response to God's offer of rescue and Reconciliation. <clears throat> now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says that there's only one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. And he taught this for two important reasons. First of all, to distinguish Jesus' baptism from other baptisms. Now, in Paul's day, there were many types of baptism being practiced. For example, the pagans, there were many pagan religions that practiced water purification rites. You had to be baptized in order to be part of them. They were mystery religions, and some of them you even had to be baptized in running water, like a running stream, you know, uh, for it to count. And then there, were, then there were the Jewish purification rites. Somebody who wanted to become a Jew, he wasn't a Jew culturally, you know, he came from another culture, but wanted, believed in the Jewish God and wanted to become, you know, a Jew in the sense of following Jehovah, following the God of the Jews. That person, if it was a man, had to be circumcised, had to offer sacrifice, 
and had to be baptized, water purification. And then of course the baptism of John, John the Baptist, he, he baptized people. And that many people during the time of Jesus and even after Jesus died and went back to heaven, there were still many people, Acts 19, right, who were still receiving John's baptism because his disciples were still alive. So Paul wanted to impress upon them that only one baptismal water ritual now counted with God. And that was the immersion in water of repentant believers in relationship to Christ. No other baptism. Now somebody will say to me, hey, what about Holy Spirit baptism? Well, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, I, you know, there's no such thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because in the Bible that term, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, does not appear. You check it out, it doesn't appear. That's something people make up. They, 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 they make up that phrase to describe something. It's baptism with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, uh, or John says, he'll come and he'll baptize you with the Spirit. Well, that was a promise to the apostles. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They received the empowering, the, the tongues of fire on their head. What do we receive? We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not the same thing. Uh, the apostles received the indwelling of the Spirit where, when Jesus said to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit in John. They received the indwelling. They received the empowering of the Spirit, Pentecost, the tongues of fire, began to speak in tongues ability to do miracles. And then they began to preach the gospel and they had the power to preach the gospel and the gospel called men to come, repent, believe, be baptized in Jesus' name and what would happen? Their sins would be forgiven and what else would they receive? The gift of the Holy Spirit. They would receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So everyone who's confessed Christ and been baptized has received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Well, you need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because Paul says in Romans 8 that if the Spirit that indwelled Christ and raised Him from the dead, if you have that Spirit, then that same Spirit will raise you from the dead. That's why. That's what's important about having the indwelling of the Spirit. It's through the power of the Spirit that we're raised from the dead. Okay? So this is why Paul is saying there's only now one baptism. Which is it? It's immersion in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the reception of the Holy Spirit. That's the only Christian baptism that exists. Number two, second reason. He also wanted to establish its importance. In every passage dealing with baptism, it is always associated with salvation. There was only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and these three were tied to the salvation offered by God. And I use salvation here in the sense that we have studied it, as the summary of all things produced by God's reconciliation. So when we talk about baptism, we're talking an interchangeable word that can be used for salvation. When somebody says, have you been baptized? In other words, have you received the one baptism? They could just as simply be saying, are you saved? Because these two words are interchangeable. Okay? The word salvation includes everything that we have discussed concerning man's reconciliation. The word and action of baptism embodies all of these same things in an actual historical fact and not just in a theological theory. I've been giving you theology, ideas, okay? Baptism is the concrete working out or expression of all these ideas at a historical moment in time. For example, I can't pinpoint the day, but I do remember November 1977. November 1977, I said in front of two guys, they're both named were Jim, Jim and Jim, only two guys, Jim Metter, one of them, said to me, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And I said, yes, I do. I now baptize you, and he immersed me, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's it, I received the one baptism of Ephesians in November of 1977, period. Do I need another baptism? Nope. Am I saved? Yep. How do I know? November 1977. 
<laughs> November 1977, I remember it. Okay? And even if I lose my memory, as my children often say, you know, Dave, you, you know what that's like. Yeah, you don't remember the question already. Uh, but, right, even if I lose my memory, God does not forget November 1977. My name went into the Book of Life, November 1977. Okay? So when a person is baptized then, that person receives in actual fact, not in theory, Christ's elect status as a chosen one of God explained in the doctrine of election. When a person is baptized, they are subject to God's promise of salvation outlined in the doctrine of predestination. When a person is baptized, they receive payment for their personal sins as the doctrine of atonement explains. When a person is baptized, they're actually set free from the judgment and condemnation they were under as the doctrine of redemption explains. When a person is baptized, they begin to experience the new life given to them by God and detailed in the doctrine of regeneration. When a person is baptized, they actually can call on God as their father, not as before, as the doctrine of adoption uh, says. And the baptized people are now truly and forever innocent and acceptable to God, as the doctrine of justification says. And baptized people are now in reality considered perfect in God's eyes, as the doctrine of perfection teaches. And these believers now live a new and different life with a new and different purpose, as the doctrine of sanctification outlines. And finally, those who believe and are baptized can say with confidence, without pride or without judgment that they are the saved because that's what the doctrine of salvation teaches. Okay. So is baptism important? Oh yes, absolutely. But a lot of times people don't recognize its importance because we fail to explain to them all the stuff that, you know, that we've been talking about. In other words, all we tell them is you have to be baptized, but you don't tell them why. You don't tell them what happens when they're baptized. See what I'm saying? All right, okay, another point. Change, change gears here, okay? There is one baptism, but there are many descriptions of salvation in the Bible. The Bible therefore teaches that there's only one baptism, that moment in time when an individual is immersed in water because of their faith in Jesus as the Son of God and they receive salvation and all the blessings that I just talked about, the problem often arises about the validity of a person's baptism and if they should do it over again. So there's confusion here because we often fail to realize that the New Testament, or rather in the New Testament, the idea of salvation is often expressed using different imagery and different terms. Now we know that baptism and salvation are related to one another, and we know how. The problem lies in the fact that when the Bible writers mentioned the idea of salvation, they didn't always use the same words. They didn't always use the same images. So let me give you some examples of this phenomenon. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, here Jesus is talking about salvation in terms of discipling. In other words, who are the saved? Well, the disciples are the saved. Make disciples. He could have said, make saved people of all nations by you know, preaching the gospel and baptizing them, but he doesn't. He says, make disciples. So here, salvation is described in terms of becoming a disciple. All right, let me give you another one. In Mark 16, 16, he says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So salvation, is he talking about salvation here? Of course, but in what context? Well, obedience. Those who obey, who believe and obey the gospel and are baptized, they're the saved. So who are the saved in Mark 16, 16? Is the word disciple in there anywhere? No. No, the understanding is those who obey the gospel, they're the saved. Let me give you another example. In John 3, 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
What is, God, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about salvation. Now is he talking about, it like, does he use the word disciple? No. Does he use the word obedience? Well, no. Well, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about a new birth. Oh, so who are the saved? Well, the ones who are born again. Is there anything different about the, the theology that, no. The only thing different is he's using a different image to describe salvation. He's using the image of being reborn, regenerated, but it's always the same salvation. Let me give you a couple of others. Acts 2.38a, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about salvation. Well, who are the saved? Well, the ones whose sins are forgiven. Has he mentioned the word disciple, born again, obedient? He hasn't talked anything about that. He's just saying the ones who are forgiven, those are the saved. All right, in the same verse, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, who are the saved? Well, the ones who have the Holy Spirit. They're the saved. Does he mention the word disciple? Does he you see, he doesn't use any of the other imagery. Now he's introduced a whole new idea. The ones who have the Spirit dwelling in them, they're the saved. Uh, another one, Acts 2.41. So then those who had received His word were baptized, and that day there were, three, uh, there were added about 3,000 souls. Added to what? Well, added to the church. Who are the saved here? Well, the saved are the ones who are added to the church. Church members, the ones who are in the church, they're the saved. Well, wait a minute, I thought you said the ones who had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I thought you said they were the saved. Well, they are the saved. The people who were added to the church, well, they also have forgiveness, they also are disciples, they also have the, the Holy Spirit within them, and so on and so forth. You see what I'm saying? I'll give you some more. Romans 6.3, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Now he's talking about salvation in terms of being buried with Christ, the imagery of baptism. So who are the saved? Well, the ones who are buried with Christ, they're the saved. Another one, Romans, uh, Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Oh, oh so salvation now is, 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 is who? Who are the saved? Well, the sons, those who are sons of God, they're the saved. Are they disciples? Oh yeah. Do they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah. Are they members of the church? Oh yeah. Have they obeyed the gospel? Oh yeah. He just doesn't mention that here. He just picks another image and describes the saved as the ones who are sons of God. How about this one? The very next verse. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Another image, those who have kind of put on righteousness, clothe themselves. So who are the saved in this verse? Well, those who have clothed themselves with Christ. Uh, do they have the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah. Are they members of the church? Uh-huh. Are they forgiven? Uh-huh. Did they obey the gospel? Uh-huh. Are they disciples? Uh-huh. It's just that Paul decided to use yet another image to describe the very same people. One more, okay? 1 Peter 3.21. Peter says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So who are the saved here? Well, the people who have a clear conscience. They're the ones who are saved. A clear conscience in Christ. Does he mention anywhere discipleship, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, members of the church, forgiveness? You know, he doesn't mention any of those other images. He described, or the Spirit, describes salvation from the perspective of having a clear conscience before God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so I want you to note some important features of these 10 scripture references, 10 of them. You know, sometimes one, you know, a matter of interpretation, two, a coincidence, but how about 10 scriptures, okay? Here are things that are common to these 10 scriptures. One, all of them refer to salvation. This is the point that they are making. The passages talk about the issue of salvation in context. And I mean salvation from the doctrinal perspective that we've been discussing it as the summary of all previous doctrines. In other words, when they were writing about salvation, these writers understood all the 20 doctrines that I've explained to you. And they were using the concept of just you know, the, the catch word salvation, saved. 
they understood that idea and what they were doing is that they were explaining it with using all kinds of different imagery and words. Always the same thing. Okay? So that's one thing they have in common. They all refer to salvation. Number two, they all use different imagery, a different perspective. They use different words to describe the very same thing. To be obedient to God is the same as to be saved. To have a clear conscience before God is the same thing as to be saved. In other words, only a saved person can be a disciple, can be obedient to God, can be born again, forgiven, filled with the Holy Spirit, a member of the church, resurrected with Christ, a child of God, wear Christ, have a clean conscience. Only a saved person can claim these things. Okay? An unsaved person could not lay claim to any one of these things, unless they are delusional. So only saved people have and experience these things. These 10 verses all use different imagery, but they're all talking about the very same thing. Okay, number three. All 10 passages explain that these things happen at baptism. Note that all these salvation passages include baptism as the dynamic moment when these things take place. You cannot separate baptism from salvation. You can't, not biblically. No matter how the writers referred to or described salvation, faith was always the constant element and baptism was always its physical expression, always. You will not find in the New Testament a writer who will say, uh, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, an example where uh, one of the apostles, one of the disciples, someone believes in Jesus and they say, good, then we want you to take a trip and go to Jerusalem and go up the steps of the temple on your knees and you shall be saved. You won't find a single example in the New Testament where someone declares their faith in Jesus Christ and one of the apostles say, great, now just accept Him as your personal Savior and you will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, a discipleship, a clear, you won't find it. You won't even find those words, you won't find that phrase, it doesn't exist. What you find if you're doing um, uh, a particular study, systematic theology, systematic theology is you pick a, a, an idea or you pick a word and you, you study that word or that idea all the way through the New Testament, that systematic theology, right? So if you study uh, faith, salvation, as systematic theology in the New Testament and you just follow salvation, what about it? All, one of the things you'll find out is that A, faith in Jesus is a constant. Every time the Bible talks about salvation or New Testament, faith in Jesus is always a constant okay, as the theory, as the theology, as the idea, as the belief point. And baptism is always the historic moment of the expression of that faith, always, always. No, no other thing, it's always baptism. So when people say, is baptism necessary? Well, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, uh, you guys, you're Church of Christ guys. No, 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 that's not a Church of Christ thing. That's a Bible thing. That's a New Testament thing. And you know, we, we, we might you know, be able to debate people on a, very, a variety of topics, you know, why we don't use instruments or you know, why only men are elders and not women. You know, we go back and forth. You know. uh, 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 but the, the question of baptism and its role in the process of our salvation, I mean, there's just uh, such a mountain of scripture. You know, it's, it's not fair. Okay, so next week, now that we, we've understood this, hopefully, next week we're going to answer the four most asked questions that invariably arise when we speak about baptism. And we're also going to speak about the proper role of communion as well, according to what we've studied. And then the last two lessons, we're going to, we're going to pick up the last two major uh, Christian uh, doctrines, okay? All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.